Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And now shall be in the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Holy Spirit to be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Good. So today's Friday, February 19, 2021. And the gospel today comes from St. Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 15. So it's a short gospel, but very deep in meaning. So I'd like everybody to really pay attention. Okay. The disciples of John approached Jesus and said, Why do we and the Pharisees fast much? But your disciples do not fast. Jesus answered them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Quite a strange answer, I'd like to think, right, to the question of why um, the disciples of Jesus do not fast. You see, fasting is uh, something that the Jews do all the time. It's very much part of their culture and their Jewish religion to have a fast, different seasons of the year. Okay? So fasting is very much part uh, uh, of their Jewishness, their way of life. And so for uh, the disciples of John, to recognize and see that, wait a minute, how come Jesus and his disciples, they, they don't seem to be fasting? Maybe not as openly as, as the uh, Pharisees and the Jews, the other Jews and disciples of John would, right? Uh, at least maybe they're not giving any public expression of their fasting. And our Lord answers them, well, if you had a wedding feast, because weddings are also a big thing in the Jewish communities, right? They, they celebrate weddings days on end with very elaborate uh, festivities. Okay? So Jesus uses the image of a wedding. During a wedding, nobody fasts. Everybody's precisely drinking it up and, <laughs> and having a lot of fun, right? Enjoying. There's no room for fasting when the bridegroom is with them in a wedding feast. They celebrate the, the, the new family life. They celebrate the new uh, potential life that would stem from marriage. Okay? So marriage and weddings are celebrations of life. And so it's a perfect image because if we try to understand fasting and why the Jews actually fasted and the purpose for fasting as part of their life we realize that fasting is actually associated with mourning. Fasting is actually associated with grieving, with the loss of life of somebody you love. Okay? Or the loss of life in one way or another, or the loss of, of a benefit or a privilege in one way or another of some other person. And so the community would fast as a way of condoling with that loss, as a way of saying, well, you know, somebody lost life, so we will mourn by fasting, by depriving ourselves of the nutrients and nourishment that give us life. That is why they deprive themselves of the pleasures of food, which is the source of nourishment for life. Okay? That is their way of condoling with somebody else's loss of life. Okay? Now, in contrast, a wedding feast is the celebration of life. So there's no room for fasting or mourning in a wedding. Okay? So that's the origin of this, of this uh, uh, way of life of, uh, of the Jews. And that is why also 
That is why also you realize that when people lose fervor from other people, especially when the, when the Jewish people would lose fervor from God, their way of making up see, is to fast because they have lost their connection, their life-giving sustenance in a spiritual way from God because of their sins in the past. So the way to make up for that was to deprive themselves of the nourishment of food and they fast. If you recall the story of Nineveh and Jonah, right? Uh, when our Lord wanted to send Jonah there to make them repent, what did the king do? Well, he declared a fast. Okay, So everybody fasted, sat in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, So that was how fasting was part of the life of the Jewish people. Okay, now Jesus tells his disciples, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? What does our Lord mean by that statement? He was affirming the fact that he was the bridegroom and that Israel, his people, is his bride. And that now that he, oh, <laughs> Ava, now that he has arrived, right? The bridegroom that Israel has been waiting for, okay, has arrived. You know, in the same way that the Jews, remember the foolish virgins? They were waiting for the bridegroom to appear in their midst. And when he came, then the celebration began, right? Now, the same thing is true with, with him now, with Jesus. He was the bridegroom that the whole of Israel has been waiting for for centuries, right? And all of a sudden, here he is. So let's celebrate, right? Let's celebrate. And in a celebration, there's no room for mourning, for fasting, so our Lord was trying to affirm that reality, that he was the one that they needed to celebrate, the bridegroom that is already in their midst, already with them. But he says also, the days will come when the bridegroom is going to be taken away. Again, he was referring to himself. Just like in a wedding feast, when the bridegroom leaves the wedding feast, okay, and 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 the bride and the groom would would settle in their chambers, okay, in their homes, then well, that was the end of the feast, <laughs> okay, that was the end of the feast. Now the same thing is true with our Lord. He said, he said, uh, he said, Ava wants to be here. He said, the days will come, the day will come. When, okay, but well you stay here with Papa, okay? The day will come when they will take away the bridegroom. And indeed, they did, right? They, they took away our Lord. They killed him. He was crucified, okay? He died, but as he predicted, he resurrected. And then he ascended into heaven. So he left us physically, the bridegroom has left the building, so to speak, right? The bridegroom has left. Of course, he left behind the Eucharist for us, right? He left us with the Holy Spirit, which he promised to guide the church. But still, still we feel like orphans, right? We still, we still feel like, well, our Lord, we, we, we lost him physically in his, in his humanity, Okay? Of course, we have the Eucharist where we have our Lord present in his body, blood, soul, and divinity. But there's a different yearning to be physically with Jesus. So we who now, who now walk the earth centuries after our Lord has left it, we feel some sense of loss. Right? We feel some sense of loss. In the very same manner that when a loved one dies, right, even if we know that we are still very much connected with them, especially if they live good lives, right, and, and we are confident because of our faith that they must be enjoying heaven with God, we feel a sense of loss, right? 
we feel a sense of loss. You know, uh, right behind us, you have the pictures of Grandpa Jacob, Grandpa Aaron on the other side. You know, uh, family patriarchs that we proudly we proudly emulate and display in our own family room uh, because of not only because they have been good people, but also because they have achieved plenty of good things for our family and they've given honor to our family name. Now, we who are left behind by these patriarchs, we feel a sense of loss for them. Okay. But at the same time, we have to remember, and the reason for displaying them here is because it has to remind us that we are beneficiaries of something very good that they have left for us. Okay? They have left us the honor of a good name. Right? And we have to feel ashamed of ourselves. And we do, in fact, feel ashamed if we tarnish that good honor, that good family name that they have left us. Right? I'm using this, this example because this is very much the same thing that happens with our Lord now. Okay? We feel a sense of loss at His departure. And He's not with us physically in the same way that He was with the apostles. Right? But really, the sense of loss that we should mourn about is the loss of God not only physically, but morally and spiritually from our souls. Okay? We are now in a period of mourning and longing to be reunited with Jesus Christ. Okay? And we are mourning the fact that many times we have lost him through our own fault, through our own sin. Okay? He has redeemed us through his death on the cross. But many times we had betrayed. We had betrayed that dignity of being children of God that he has restored to us upon his death on the cross. Somebody's competing with me. <laughs> okay. Many times through sin, okay, we lose that dignity again. We, we, we tarnish the good name, the good honor, the honorable name, the dignity of being children of God. See? And, and that is why we, we mourn for that loss. That's why we make up for that loss. In the same way that we have to make up every time. You know, we have to feel a great sense of, of, of loss. <laughs> I have competition. We have, we have to feel a great sense of loss and remorse. If we do something foolish that tarnishes our family name eh? or your family name that you carry so proudly uh, in order to honor the patriarchs who have given you such families, family names and such honor. Right? So now during Lent, the church wants to remind us of this terrible sinfulness that we carry. Okay, that that we that we walk uh, uh, through life with, and that we need to mourn. We need to to be sorry. We need to do penance. We need to make up for this loss of the grace of God in our souls through sin. And that is the reason why the church encourages us. They not only. To say sorry, but to aggressively, aggressively manifest that sorrow for sin through heavier penances like fasting. Okay? Imitating in one way the Jewish tradition of fasting, which is one of the good things that we uh, brought in and incorporated in the Catholic faith. So, fasting for us, okay, mortifying ourselves, doing extra penances this period of Lent is our way of expressing to God how much we mourn the loss of His grace in our souls. Okay? And this journey uh, is also in preparation for meeting Him again eternally in heaven 
when it is our time to go and meet him uh, upon our death. So Lent is a period uh, within which the church invites us to intensify our uh, spirit of penance, our prayer, our supplication to God. And we need to take advantage of this particular time. Okay? And how do we do that? How do we do that? So concretely, through acts of sacrifice, like, okay, fasting, abstinence, acts of, uh, acts of mortification, uh, 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 depriving ourselves of certain comforts, okay, during the period of Lent. You'll hear it many times, right? What are you giving up for Lent? <laughs> what are you giving up for Lent? Well, you know, giving up for Lent, giving up something for Lent is a very good thing. But let's not forget that Lent is not all about giving up something. Okay? It is also about gaining something. It is also about growing in something. It is also about uh, developing something in ourselves. Okay? And for example, uh, one of the better ways I know of uh, doing Lent, besides giving up something, is is doing more of something, growing more in something, particularly in virtue. Okay? Virtue. We can grow more in virtue. We can um, improve in the way that we live certain virtues. And that alone, doing that alone, pursuing that alone, can be difficult, can be tough, and can require sacrifice. For example, take the, take the example of the virtue of patience. Very hard to live. Right? The virtue of order. The virtue of punctuality. Just making good use of your time. Okay? I'm telling you, it's a lot easier to deprive yourselves of chocolate or candy than to pursue the practice of virtue. Than to pursue a relentless objective of growing in even just one virtue this season of Lent. I would challenge each and every one of you, you know, besides doing physical penance, okay, try to grow in a particular virtue this season of Lent. And I am guaranteeing you it could be a lot more difficult than depriving yourself of chocolate or candy or whatever have you. See? So Lent is a very good time. Very good time, not only to give up something, but to gain something, particularly gaining in virtue. And that would be a very good form of fasting. See? Because when you gain virtue, it, all, it means you're giving up the contrary vice, See? The, the contrary bad habit, which gives you pleasure. Okay? Because you know what? It's a lot easier, convenient, and maybe more satisfying to be, <laughs> to be uh, uh, not to be virtuous. It's easier, more comfortable to be lazy. It's easier, more comfortable to oh, just leave things around and don't bother fixing it because I get stressed when I put things in their proper places. Oh, it's a lot easier to just take my day as though nothing is happening and I don't have to be punctual about any appointment. It's easy, convenient, right? Nice, pleasurable, but wrong. So if we give up those comforts and gain the contrary virtue, okay, the ones that the virtue that will fight that vice, then we are actually sacrificing. We are actually performing some kind of penance. Penance from the bad things in order to gain the good virtue. Uh, uh, to help our souls grow in grace. Okay. That should be it for us folks today. And Eva has been competing with us. So now you say goodbye, Eva. Where are you? Come here. Come here. Right here. Okay. Say goodbye here. Come on. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. We'll see you again. See you again. Okay. <laughs> Very good, girl.
Very good. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Have a good weekend ahead of you. Bye-bye. We'll see you next week.